most people, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adria Adi, and I am one of the music faculty here at CSM. Um, and along with uh, my colleague, Professor Chris Gabrowski, and Professor Brenda Hutchinson, um, we have been working on developing this new music and technology program, which we're very excited about. And um, as part of this program, which stay tuned for more info to come on that, um, we last year we launched a this careers in uh, music and technology uh, careers in music and technology lecture series, and this I believe is our sixth installment. So very excited about that, and stay tuned for more um, info coming soon. Hopefully about who our two spring speakers will be. Um, but I wanted before I forget wanted to thank the Strong Workforce team, the Perkins Grant, um, of course our Creative Arts and Social Science. Uh, Division and our Dean John Marie Malikovic for their all of their support of this program. Of course, thank you to the man behind the camera, Nicolas Fernandez, our instructional aide, with, with whom we could not do any of this without flyer maker extraordinaire, video documenter. Um, also heads uh, wanted to point out to check out the CSM Digni YouTube channel. Nicolas has been really uh, documenting all of our guest talks there, so if you ever want to go back and revisit what someone said, you can always check out the YouTube channel, other great stuff there, so check that out. Um, what else? Of course, thank you to Justin and Christine, our student assistants um, on our electronic music team. We are very fortunate to have both of you. And um, yeah, just super excited to introduce Heidi Trepathan and have her here today. She's a very human, uh, very uh, busy human being. She's very human. I'm also <laughs> She's very human. Um, <laughs> surprise. Uh, but no, she's a very busy human, so very lucky to have nabbed her for a little bit of her time. And um, yeah, as probably many of you have read, uh, Heidi is an amazing audio engineer working in both live sound, um, front of house at SF Jazz and Freight and Salvage, amazing venues. Um, studio engineer, I know she has engineered multiple places. 25th, we were just talking about uh, 25th Street Studios in Oakland. I don't know if, how many of you have heard of that space. It's a wonderful studio in Oakland. Um, she's also engineered at Skywalker Sound to just name drop a big <laughs> amazing studio. Um, but outside of audio engineering, she's also an incredible musician, uh, multi-instrumentalist, French horn player, plays in local orchestras around town, um, composer. I could just keep listing things one after another, but I think you will hear about it in her talk today. So, so grateful for you to be here and um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Adria, and everyone uh, on the faculty and staff here at College of San Mateo. Uh, it is such a pleasure um, to be with you today, and I am so excited um, to spend the next hour and a half together. Thank you for um, spending your time uh, by coming. Um, as Adria said, uh, my name is Heidi Trefethen. Um I'm a recording and live engineer, as she mentioned, producer, composer, um, an educator and a musician. Um, and sometimes I sleep. That's <laughs> something that I always put at the end of that sentence. And we were actually talking just a, a minute ago um, saying that we should um, find a way to clone ourselves. And then we were wondering, you know, so the other one could rest. And then we were wondering, well, would we get along with our clones? Um, at any rate, um, I hope, um, if you walk away with nothing else today, it's uh, just how much passion uh, and how I have for music, um, both recording and performing and writing, and how um, incredible uh, the musical experience is, whether you're listening or creating. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my history today, uh, of my career, how I got started, and, um, and then I'm going to talk about um, something I'm very passionate about, um, diversity in the music industry, um, but specifically um, music technology. Uh, it's not, these are not just buzzwords. Uh, it's an extremely important uh, work that we're doing. So I'll talk more about that, my work in the Recording Academy and the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee. Um, as an ambassador. And I'll share a little um, bit about a project uh, that I'm working on currently, original, 
Um, and then um, I'll open the floor up to questions. And I would invite you to stop me if you have a question. Um, you can feel free to raise your hand and just um, shout it out and uh, I'll be happy to answer it for you. Um, I'm actually not used to being on this side of the mic. I'm usually back um, in the audience um, at front of house or monitors um, mixing. Um, but I do love being on this side of the, um, of the microphone. Um, okay, we, we're, we're good. Okay, so I always loved music. I don't remember a time in my life that I wasn't um, just enthralled by the whole experience. My mother played the acoustic guitar. Uh, my dad played the piano. And music was always going on in our house in some form or another. Uh, whether we were, you know, whether my dad was uh, spinning his LPs um, or my mom was, uh, put me right next to her on the floor as a baby and played me Judy Collins songs. And one of the really neat experiences uh, most recently was that I uh, worked with Judy Collins at Freight and Salvage. It was a soundtrack to my childhood. And I invited my mom, I flew her out um, from Colorado. She saw the second uh, concert of a two night run. And at the end, uh, I was able to introduce my mom to Judy Collins. And it was a really beautiful full circle moment for both of us. Uh, it, one of the most special things about that was um, that Judy doesn't meet people anymore. She doesn't sign autographs. She just doesn't meet the public. So I felt very fortunate um, to have that experience. And I'll always remember it. Um, and so we always had a piano, uh, in addition to a guitar and, and some other instruments in the house. And um, my grandmother was a concert pianist. And she put me down at the piano right away and started um, kind of like uh, with her hand, you know, had me play the keys, and I was, at the age of three, I was playing uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb um, by ear. And I started taking piano lessons, um, I think around the age, at the age of five, with someone in my neighborhood. And fast forward just a little bit, I think it was fourth grade. Uh, I grew up in Seattle, or right outside of Seattle in Bellevue, Washington. That was before Microsoft was there. Uh, different world then. Uh, the Seattle Symphony came to my elementary school, and uh, I remember sitting in the gymnasium with all the other kids and looking at this incredible orchestra with all these fascinating instruments, and when they started playing, I just absolutely fell in love with um, orchestral music. And um, after, uh, we were asked uh, if we would, you know, to, to come up after to talk to the musicians. Um, if we wanted to, um, you know, find out more about an instrument and also talk to the band director of the school. And um, I was asked, um, I was really, really drawn to the French horn because I mean, it's just such a, an amazing looking instrument. It's actually uh, 12 feet of tubing when you unravel it all. It's three octaves, I believe. Um, from a pedal F all the way up to um, a high F above the staff. Uh, so many beautiful colors and characters it plays in classical, uh, you know, orchestral music. Um, at any rate, um, so I was asked what instrument I wanted to play, and it was between the cello and the French horn. Um, my fingers, they felt, were too um, short for <laughs> stringed instruments. Um, and actually, when I said I want to play the French horn, um, one of the band directors, he didn't become my band director, but he said, well, uh, girls don't play the French horn. They play the flute uh, or the clarinet. And I thought, no, no, they don't. <laughs> so I asked my parents to I said, I want to play the French horn, and I asked my parents to make sure that um, I was able to get a French horn and play. And I did. I started at age nine. My band director, um, Mike Chapin, was actually Harry Chapin's cousin, um, the artist who sang 
the Silver Spoon song, Cats in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon. Um, I remember my very first note. It was a middle C, and my audition went really well. Um, I was first chair um, all the way um, through high school. Um, in fact, my junior year of high school, um, I got a full scholarship to Idlewild School of Music and the Arts, uh, which is now Idlewild Arts. It's in um, Idlewild, California, um, in the San Jacinto Mountains above Palm Springs. The school, that was, I think, the second year, uh, it was very small. And my teacher uh, was Kurt Snyder. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, he was principal of Las Vegas um, Philharmonic and also played in the LA Phil. And I left home when I was about um, 15. And that was an interesting time in my life, having roommates and leaving my brothers and my parents. Um, it wasn't easy. Um, but it was worth it. So uh, during the day, we had academics at uh, a school called Elliott Pope Preparatory School. And in the evening, uh, we had music classes. So I was taking theory. I had a bunch of chamber music, ensembles to play in, music history. Um, it was like going to college in junior year. Um, senior year, I ended up going to Brigham Young University. Um, I finished there my senior year of high school in addition to starting um, my freshman year um, in music, uh, performance, and pedagogy. That was um, my major. Um, it was a very interesting place to be. Um, the music department was uh, incredible. It was uh, almost unmatched at the time. Uh, besides, you know, University of Michigan and Juilliard. I actually did audition for Juilliard when I was at um, Idlewild School of Music and the Arts, and I got in, but I decided I wanted a more well-rounded education, so I went the university route. And uh, growing up a member of the Mormon Church, it was kind of expected that I would go um, to Brigham Young University. Um, had a great experience there. Um, I did several tours with the orchestra to England, Scotland, and Wales, uh, Europe, um, all over the US. Um, it was a fantastic education. Um, I took um, one recording class, one semester. That's really all I had time for. I was also on a full scholarship, um, Horn scholarship. And so uh, I was obligated uh, to uh, play in several chamber groups and orchestras, and that took up pretty much all my time. But that was um, something I'd always wanted to do. So rewinding a little bit, um, when I was nine, um, my parents, well, I grew up in a um, VW bus. That was the car that my parents had, and they had a cassette player in there. Remember cassettes? Remember CDs? <laughs> um, so my uncle gave me all of his uh, Beatles cassettes. I don't remember why, um, but I happily took them, and I listened to every one of them, and I studied uh, the mixes. I didn't know I was doing it th at the time, um, but I al always had listened to um, music very, in a very analytical way. Um, I was able to separate each instrument at an early age and uh, was able to play things um, by ear very easily. Come to find out, when I was at Preferring Arts High School, uh, it was discovered that I had um, perfect pitch, and which has been really helpful and also quite a challenge at times, believe it or not. When anything's out of tune, it, uh, it just, I, I can't, can't do it. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I studied the mixes, and I noticed um, that on several of the early recordings, um, the instruments in the mastering process were panned to one side, and the vocals were panned to the other side. And one uh, recording in particular, the one that All My Loving is on, was actually mastered that way. 
And it was because uh, stereo was actually a very new technology then. Kind of like, if you can imagine, stereo being new at all, um, not unlike um, immersive formats um, today, uh, like Dolby Atmos or Apple Spatial Audio or Sony 360. Um, and so somehow um, I figured out that if I took this cassette to the car, to the VW bus, put it in there, turned it on, panned everything all the way to the instrument side, and I took um, a cassette player uh, with a blank cassette, um, I pressed play on the car stereo so the instruments were coming out of all my loving. And um, I sang the song uh, with the music playing in the background and pressed record. So I actually did my first overdub on the, <laughs> um, you know, of all my loving um, at the age of nine. And so that just goes to show you that, uh, just to represent um, how interested and intrigued um, I was at that age um, in music technology and recording and, and listening to instruments and how they sounded in a mix and how they were balanced. So I was really excited to take that class in college and that was really the only one that I was able to take because of time constraints. Anyway, fast forward. After college, I moved out here uh, to the Bay Area, uh, to San Francisco, and did a lot of uh, freelancing in orchestras um, and you know several other uh, jobs to fill in the gaps. And it wasn't until the late 90s that um, I really wanted to pursue uh, engineering uh, in earnest. And I had an opportunity to either get my master's. Um, I auditioned and got into the San Francisco Conservatory of Music uh, for horn performance. Um, or I could uh, go to a nine-month engineering program. I didn't want to go back to university. So I decided that I wanted to just keep it short so I could get on with uh, my career. And I went to. Um, a program called, uh, or a school called, um, it was uh, California Recording Institute, I always forget the name. And that was um, South of Market, I think 11th and Howard or something. And the teacher, Dave Gibson, actually wrote a book called The Art of Mixing. It's, it's pretty famous and it's a great uh, visual guide to mixing, to the theory of mixing. Uh, he actually worked with Thomas Dolby, um, the artist who sang uh, blinded me with science. And he had a lot of really great stories to tell. Um, I got a great education. I was uh, one of two women um, in a class of 30 students. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we were treated a little bit differently. We didn't have the same access uh, to labs. Um, we weren't encouraged in the same way. But um, Sherry, the other woman's name, uh, we persevered and we supported each other and we did great work and I got a great um, start. So the great education and start to my career. Uh, one of the pluses of that program, the thing that was uh, that set it apart from other programs, I think, was that not only were we um, recording right away and learning theory of recording, but uh, Mr. Gibson, or Dave, um, pretty much threw us on the board right away to start mixing. There were three studios, um, so we were able to do a lot you know, during lab time, but also during class time. And that, um, I think, was one of the things that set me up for success in uh, my, definitely my live sound career, but also recording career. Um, I got my first job out of that program at uh, Freight and Salvage. I don't think it's as easy um, to get a job there as it was. I took my resume to the director 
And I said, I love acoustic music. I would love to work here. I'm graduating from this program, and I, that was really all it took. But I did have to prove myself. Um, I had to work several open mics um, before I was put on um, an actual show. I think that was a great uh, way to learn how to do live sound, just throwing you in. Um, I had to make decisions really, really quickly about balance, EQ, mixing. Um, and I have been working there since that time. So that was, I think, 1999. So I've been at Freight and Salvage for 23 years now. I have um, worked with some incredible artists like um, Michelle Adega Cello, Sean Colvin, um, Herb Alpert, Lanny Hall, um, let's see, Judy Collins, um, Dar Williams. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, it's been an incredible experience. But let me just back up to the French horn. I want to show you a couple pictures. So this is, um, I'm playing second horn here. And this is Santa Cruz Symphony. We're performing um, Gus of Holt's The Planets. You guys familiar with that piece? It is a really great piece. I would highly recommend it. And um, Leonard Bernstein, uh, the late conductor of the New York Phil and composer, actually did an educational series uh, for children based on this, using this piece. It's out there on YouTube, so I would highly recommend it. Um, I also play uh, in the Silicon Valley Symphony. Um, this was, uh, I was playing co-principal at this time. So um, I was basically taking a portion of the principal part and letting the principal uh, rest, rest her chops. She's right there, her name's Meredith. That was Mahler Five. Um, an incredible work from the Romantic period. Are you guys familiar with Mahler at all? This is my favorite uh, piece by Mahler, Mahler V. Um, I also have a horn duo. We won an MGP grant from Intermusic SF uh, right before the pandemic hit. And last September of 2021, uh, we gave a concert of, um, this is obviously not this is a trio right now, but the two hornists right here, myself and my colleague, we make up the duo. Um, the grant was to fund um, a, a composition um, by a woman. Her name is Ida Shirazi. She's originally from Iran, extremely talented. Um, we met her in Turkey on one of our tours, and so we wanted to work with her again. It combined two horns and electronics. So I did some Ableton work that you can't see here necessarily, along with um, some horn playing. That was um, a lot of fun, and it was uh, a lot of work, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I also played in North State Symphony um, up at Chico, um, CSU Chico. That was another concert of Mahler V. Um, I also played uh, French horn in Il Teatro dell'Opera di Roma when I moved to Italy in 2003. I was there for three years, and I played um, with the opera company uh, for three years. I loved Italy. I had an incredible experience there, uh, musically and also personally. Um, I'll never forget it. Um, I came back uh, fluent. Um, and with some wonderful Italian colleagues and friends. Uh, I went back several years later uh, to play at the Jazz Up Festival and to be a judge on the panel um, of the competition. Uh, the conductor is Claudio Cimpanelli, and he's a second trumpet um, in the opera uh, of Rome. And he's a very prolific composer of classical, but also um, jazz works. And we were, um, he actually hired me to play horn for this concert and be a judge. If that weren't enough, I decided, <laughs> I actually didn't decide, but it, it just kind of fate. Um, 
I did some work um, at Cliff Bar and Company, the company that makes Luna Bars and Cliff Bars, um, for about five years. I wasn't actually doing music full time. I took a little break, which you're allowed to do. Um, and the owner uh, was a trumpet player, and he decided he wanted to uh, form a band. We, a lot of us at the company were musicians, and he encouraged us a lot to uh, pursue and work on our talents. Um, and there were two other bands uh, made up of employees of the company. Um, anyway, he got wind of the Battle of the Bands competition that was held each year at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland, Ohio. And ambitious as he is, um, he basically got all of the players together from our company. We're all employees, I think, except for one, the sax player. He's a chiropractor. Um, and he decided that he wanted us to go for this award, this competition. And he needed a trombone player, and he knew that I played French horn. So he said, if I buy you a trombone, do you think you can learn trombone and play trombone parts on songs, you know, like old school 70s R&B? And um, I said, sure, why not? <laughs> um, so he bought me a trombone, and I basically taught myself. Um, it wasn't too much of a stretch going from French horn. I mean, the mouthpiece is about this big for a trombone, and a French horn mouthpiece is about that big. So there was an adjustment, yes. And I just, the arm, like how, no. It, it actually worked out really well. Um, we won the competition all three rounds, and our picture is actually still in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, and we were also in uh, Fortune magazine in the December 3rd, 2012 edition. This is us um, right here. There's an article about us. So this is a really, um, this is a really special memory for me. Do I play trombone anymore? I don't. I don't play trombone. Um, still play the horn. Um, most recently, uh, or one of my gigs most recently was at the Bear Valley Music Festival. Um, playing second horn, um, and this was a concert, um, a program that we did um, to honor Michael Morgan, um, the late conductor of the Oakland uh, Symphony. So we lost him, I think, last year uh, for health reasons. Um, he was an incredible uh, musician and conductor and mentor and championed uh, women and people of color in uh, the orchestra and the area, and I would say the, the country as well. Uh, one of his mentors is Michael Tilson Thomas, who was the uh, conductor of the San Francisco Symphony for many years. Um, so this is our wonderful horn section. Um, I have never had an experience like playing Beethoven 7 uh, at 8,000 feet. That was quite a, an interesting <laughs> experience, trying to get enough air to play um, the horn solo, the second horn solo. Are you guys familiar with Beethoven 7? If we have time, maybe I'll play a little bit after. Um, in addition, I'm a founding member of the SF Jazz Monday Night Band. Um, so this uh, is me playing the horn uh, with Adam Thies, um, director. Uh, you may be familiar with Adam Thies. Um, he is one of the directors of, or the creators and founders of this band, but also Jazz Mafia in the Bay Area. He's been touring with Bob Weir. Yes? Have you ever tried playing uh, the alto horn with the French horn mouthpiece? You know, I haven't. That's um, my, a couple of friends of mine. Uh -huh. And the brass right. band doesn't normally have a French horn. Uh -huh. They play an alto horn instead. Oh, interesting. They can be made so you can just take your French horn mouthpiece and drop it in there. And then you have three valves like, you know, a trumpet or a baritone. Right. And actually, 
the French horn has um, actually two horns in it, a B-flat side and a, uh, an F side. And you change the key by using your thumb valve. So when you press down the key, it, it goes to B-flat. And so that would be a natural progression, yeah. for sure. I've heard of that, yeah. yeah. I can only imagine. Brass bands are great. Maybe I'll, I'll put that on the list. Um, I have played flugelhorn. It's a beautiful instrument. Also, um, music is written for it. In F, which is the key that the horn, uh, horn music is written in, except if you're doing like um, Brahms or Mozart, or many of the romantic and classical composers uh, write in several different keys for horn. And it is because before valves, um, in the late 1800s, I believe it was, um, hornists played what was called the natural horn without valves. And so you, could, you would change the key, not with valves, but with, by putting a crook in. And so the larger the crook, um, the farther the key would be transposed down to, if that makes sense. So a little bit of trivia about the horn. Um, this is me at Davies um, when I played, not with the San Francisco Symphony, um, but with um, Marin Symphony. Why do I have two horns? Well, I was trying to make double money, actually. I thought, if I have two horns, I play them at the same time. Can I make more? I'm kidding. Um, I was actually holding um, one. And I think I have two pictures on this slide. Um, but this was a recording session that I did um, playing, performing, with Tammy Hall, um, jazz pianist. Um, pretty active and um, well-known in the area. So we did a, a recording, I think in 2000, is many years ago. Studio Trilogy, sadly, like many studios in the area, is uh, closed. Um, it was a beautiful studio. And this is me uh, playing at Skywalker um, in, let's see, 2021, May, I did an immersive recording. Um, the name was Pariah by the artist Chalista. And um, I mixed in 7.1.2. And I also played uh, horn on two different uh, tracks. And I have never heard myself sound so good as I did in Skywalker. The room is absolutely phenomenal and very tunable. I've played uh, in other recordings there and actually have produced um, a different recording uh, several years ago, um, the Marin uh, Youth Symphony. I produced that recording. And I did a session at uh, Women's Audio Mission for another artist in the area. Um, I tried uh, several, a few different mics on the horn. Uh, the first couple I tried were ribbon mics. And so I actually recorded this by pressing spacebar, or no, actually three on the numeric keyboard on Pro Tools and running into <laughs> the, um, the live room to play the horn part. Um, next time, I might have someone else do that for me. Uh, yes. My clone. Yes, Why my clone. Did you like ribbon What's that? Why did you like ribbon microphone? Um, well, actually, I didn't finish my thought. And my thought was that I actually don't care for ribbon mics on horn because of their um, dark sounding nature and the horn being um, very mellow sounding without a lot of upper overtones. And so something like an M49 or U67 or even U87 um, is a great choice. Uh, but that's, you know, like I always say, it depends. That's not the case all the time. But if we go back to this slide, this microphone behind me um, is actually a Royer SF2, and that sounded great on the horn. And I actually deferred to Dan Thompson, who's um, assistant engineer at Skywalker. I didn't argue with him at all. 
<laughs> um, it sounded great. So interestingly enough, and maybe counterintuitively, this is not actually where you get the best horn sound behind the bell. It's the most focused sound, um, but you get the best sound actually in front of the horn and somewhat above. And again, it all depends on the room, how it's treated, the size of the room, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the kind of horn and the player. So that's a, a little technical note on this slide. OK. And um, of course, I'm a live engineer, as you know, um, freight and salvage for 23 years. This was a very special uh, night. I think this was September 9th, 2021. And it was the night that we reopened um, after being closed down for, oh, I guess at that point it was about a year and a half. That was, um, that was a, a very challenging time for everyone for so many different reasons. Um, it was really, really hard for me to have to stop working because I love working so much. So this was the first show is um, Adrian Shamzad. She's an Iranian American uh, musician in the Bay Area. It, there was so much emotion that night. Um, it was just absolutely thrilling. Um, I may not mention <laughs> how, you know, it took me a little bit of time to figure out what does this button do again? And I'm actually not the only one. Um, some of the best engineers I've worked with um, at this point and after had the same experience. But it's like riding a bike. We use a Soundcraft um, VI 5000. Um, we were using the VI 4. Um, it's a fantastic console, great sounding pre's. Um, you can't go wrong with um, Soundcraft. It's like a touch screen um, with faders, basically. It's uh, fantastic. This is another view of Freight and Salvage. This is actually ties into my uh, work as an educator. Um, this was around the same time. Uh, this is uh, my live sound class at Freight and Salvage that I teach twice a year for a women's audio mission. And I'll talk about women's audio mission um, shortly. Got to keep track of the time. I'm going to move forward here a little bit. Um, I had the honor uh, to work with Leslie Ann Jones um, last month at Freight and Salvage, mixing Blame Sally for two nights. Um, I basically did monitors on one side of the board. We set it up so I could do monitors on one side of the board, and she could mix the band on the other side of the board. That was pretty cool. I will always remember it. I always learn something from her and all of the great engineers I work with. Um, this is up above us. You can see um, my Royer SF24 um, stereo ribbon mic. Uh, we use that for the live stream the second night for the audience. And I do monitors in front of house at SF Jazz. Um, this is my view from Monitor Worlds. Uh, doing monitors for Artemis, an all-woman um, jazz band. Some of the um, all-stars in the jazz world, like Allison Miller on drums, um, and several others. Um, I love mixing monitors. It's a totally different world than doing front of house. Um, it's also the best seat in the house, so I would highly recommend um, learning how to be a monitor engineer. Um, this is another view of Monitor World. Um, this is a setup um, several years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, lots of percussion and drums, as you can see. And this is what it looks like um, before um, the audience comes in. This is what it looks like before doors open, and even actually before sound check, or it could be after. Um, this is me in minor. That's the one that seats, I think, around 600 people. Um, that is an avid um, venue console. Um, 
we have an Avid at front of house as well as in monitor world um, in minor hall. Um, there is a smaller room, Joe Henderson Lab. It seats about 80 people, and we usually do two shows, shows a night so that we can, you know, at least get some more audience members in because we can't really fill uh, uh, too much, you know, we can't get many more people than that. Um, and the room sounds great. I love mixing in minor, um, but Joe Henderson Lab is a fantastic room. Counterintuitive, um, the two of the walls, um, they face out to the street, um, which creates a really cool performing experience for the artist and also for people who are driving by or walking by. Um, so it's counterintuitive because of those glass walls, but um, the diffusion and the treatment in the room is so good that it's just a really nice, tight, but live sound. And I'm a recording engineer. Um, the picture of me on the left is at Women's Audio Mission. Um, I am doing another session. Um, of, I think the band was uh, The Loyal Seas. So if you remember Tanya Donnelly from Throwing Muses from the early 90s, and she actually was a founder of The Breeders. So she and uh, one of her friends named Brian Sully, during the pandemic, um, finally were able to finish their work. They were working on for several years, and so I tracked drums and guitar and vocals there. On the right, I'm at 25th Street um, doing a live stream of Sierra Ensemble um, doing the Brahms Horn Trio. So that's piano, um, violin, and French horn. I am not playing the French horn. <laughs> um, I'm leaving that to the hornist. And that was a, a live stream for, I think, a local six musicians union. Women's Audio Mission once again. Um, this is at 25th Street. Uh, this is a Skywalker, uh, the day I, I was uh, tracking horn. Um, on the right, uh, the same photo was used for my lecture uh, for AES Bolivia uh, last year. How does time fly? I, um, my presentation was engineering equality from mic to mastering. And this is my assistant. Bibi, she just lays on music and she can just absorb everything. I'm hoping to gain that skill <laughs> someday. Um, of course, I had to get a cat in there because I'm a cat lover. Um, one of my passions is education. I love mentoring, I love teaching, I love to see the lights go on when concepts are understood after being, um, you know, abstract for so long. I love to see those dots connect and facilitating that. Um, last January, I went to Thailand, um, Bangkok, at Mahidan University to give a lecture for two days about um, orchestral recording. And I did a recording uh, with them, with the students uh, of the Thailand Philharmonic. Their home is Mahidan University in Bangkok. Um, so these are my students here on the left, and on the right, uh, that is the, uh, their new conductor as of last January, the first woman to ever conduct the Thailand Philharmonic, and the chair of um, the music department on the right-hand side. It was a great collaboration. I also talked about um, diversity in engineering, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, this is me at Academy of Art University where I'm teaching now. Um, level 200 Pro Tools and session recording and a graduate level mixing class. I also started teaching at Institute for the Musical Arts um, in Massachusetts. Um, I um, authored their uh, online program that they had to pivot to, the pandemic. Um, one of my teachers who I teach with, um, her name is Roma Barron, and she actually, with Lou Reed, uh, co-produced Laurie Anderson, um, Superman. And so Laurie's on the board, and I was on a call with Laurie Anderson, Roma, and Leslie Ann Jones, who I took over from, and June Millington, who was in the band Fanny. Are you guys familiar with Fanny? You know, it, it, they were 
a seminal rock band in the late 70s, early 80s. All women. It was totally radical at the time. Um, she has a lot of interesting stories, and she's part of that. Uh, she's one of the founders with um, Anne Hackler. Okay. Uh, this is my digital lab at SF Jazz, and I am. This is a picture of one of my assignments in class. Uh, we did intro to songwriting and production um, in Logic. I've been teaching there since about 2015. Uh, this was a women's audio mission event, um, engineering prints. Um, so we had three, or actually four, or no, five, maybe five of Prince's engineers who are all women, which I think says a lot about Prince. Really inspiring. So I did the sound for that. Um, this is another uh, picture at SF Jazz. And I was actually in Thailand several years ago um, before last January uh, doing a French horn uh, master class with my colleague who's on the left there. And that is also at Mahidon University. So I've had a really great relationship with the university for several years and have just loved my time there. A few years ago, um, I was invited to join the Recording Academy. So the Recording Academy actually puts on the Grammys, but it is so much more um, than the Grammys, and I'll talk more about that. Um, I was invited to join as a voting member. It's all peer recommendations, and you have to have a certain number of um, credits to be eligible um, to become a voting member. And so I've had the honor of voting on the Grammys uh, for about three years now. Um, today it was announced, but I haven't had time to check, um, a recording that I did um, editing on, um, which was Leslie Ann Jones's production of Beethoven, The Conquering Hero, the complete works for cello and piano, um, might be nominated for a Grammy. So I'm, after we're done here, I'm gonna look it up. I have to, I have to know. So um, I guess there's no point in crossing fingers at this point. Um, but just even to um, work on that project and to have it shortlisted uh, for a consideration and nomination is, um, just brings me so much joy. Um, this is, I also get to go to the Grammys. So this is me at the Grammys, um, missing one year when it was televised, because you know why. Um, that was, I think, 2020, right before the pandemic started. And the one on the right is uh, this last year, in April, in Las Vegas. So it was really fun to dress up and take pictures and meet a lot of cool people and celebrate everyone's accomplishments. Um, don't let anyone tell you that um, the awards, the Grammy Awards are rigged or somehow um, not carried out with integrity. That is entirely not true. It is a 100% peer voted award on all, all three um, stages of the awards. Um, so it really is recognizing the excellence of your peers. Uh, I'm also on the board of directors uh, for the San Francisco chapter. Um, in addition, I actually just stepped down. I termed out my term, my two-year term uh, finished as the DEI ambassador from the San Francisco chapter to the national team. So there's uh, one member um, from each chapter, and we work closely with um, the CEO, Harvey Mason Jr., and Valicia Butterfield, um, the DEI, the chief officer of DEI. And we accomplished a great deal. We completed the Women in the Mix study, which I'll talk about briefly. 
in addition to creating um, the music industry's first inclusion writer. So that means um, encouraging uh, the hiring. You know, we can't really require it, but we encourage the hiring of um, women of color and all women and gender uh, diverse people. Um, we have made it mandatory to have, um, if the union actually doesn't provide this um, stipulation, um, we um, require access, equal access, um, to like ramps for people who are um, differently abled. Um, we also um, are requiring at the awards ceremonies um, uh, an ASL interpreter so that everyone can participate. And it just has brought me uh, so much happiness and satisfaction in being part of this uh, very important work um, because it's not just lip service. We really do believe that everyone belongs and that everyone has a voice. And to facilitate um, the participation of everyone is um, a very strong value. And it's also a very strong personal value of mine. So that leads me to, this is actually the presentation I gave um, in Thailand, in Bangkok, um, last January, <clears throat> entitled Diversity in Sound Engineering. Who has ever felt like they didn't belong somewhere? Me too. How does that feel? I know. <laughs> I know. How does it feel to not belong? In general, how does it feel? It what? Alienating. It feels alienating, right. Have you ever felt like you don't belong at work? I have too. How does it feel to not feel like you belong at work? What does it do to your work product or your motivation or what have you? What does it do? Low self-esteem, self absolutely. Do you feel like you can give your best work? It's really hard to do that when there's that challenge in front of you all the time and day after day, it can really wear you down. And I've felt that way many times in my career, even currently. There are times when I encounter um, sexism or other isms just because I'm a woman. And you know, I get the second guessing um, I get looked over for promotions or advancement. Um, and I've encountered situations where uh, certain people can't even believe that I would know what I'm talking about. And it's so discouraging. And because I have, and I actually, um, when I was coming up in my career, like when I started at Freight and Salvage, I didn't know any other women engineers. I didn't know Leslie Ann Jones. I didn't know Terry Winston from Women's Audio Mission. I felt really alone a lot. And I didn't really have a mentor who I could talk to. And as a live engineer, um, you're working by yourself all the time. So it has become a great passion of mine um, to mentor women of all colors and gender diverse people and helping to make uh, the music industry and especially music technology a place where we feel like we belong. Um, why is diversity important? Less than 5% of the people creating the sounds, music and media in the daily soundtrack of our lives are women or gender non-conforming and disabled individuals and people of color. Can you imagine? Less than 5%. So what does that mean out of 1,000 people, there are less than 50 people in these groups creating sounds, music, and media that we hear every day. And I'm here to tell you, after being on several um, committees um, giving prominent awards, um, that, um, how do I put it, um, that um, 
my experience, sometimes men and women make different choices in that process of recognizing the excellence of a peer. It's sometimes it's subconscious, but the presence of women and each one of these people um, in these groups uh, is so important that we're represented. It represented, excuse me, I can't quite get the word out. Um, this is uh, an update from December 2021. I apologize, I don't have a more current um, stat. Uh, currently less than 2% um, is the latest stat that I have, most likely due to the pandemic and loss of work in the entertainment industry. So that went down about 3%. And that is a little alarming to me. Um, and that decline, that 70 percent decline in women, girls enrolling in college, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math programs um, since the year 2000. Excuse me, there's an alarming 70 uh, percent decline in that. So with that updated 21, 2021 stat, for every um, thousand music creators, only 20 people are women, gender non-conforming, and disabled individuals, and people of color. Do you think that feels kind of isolating? Would you feel kind of isolated? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't end there, the importance of diversity. Um, music, what is music? What is, how would you define music? It is a bunch of notes, yes, put together, for sure, in an organized fashion or disorganized. It's also valid. It's basically telling a story. Music is storytelling, and every culture in history has told their stories through their unique music. And hearing and understanding people's stories, especially those whose cultures and communities we may be unfamiliar with, uh, creates empathy and compassion. When voices of people are silenced by discrimination, we lose the opportunity to hear their stories we lose the opportunity to tell them and to learn from them. How important is it to you personally that you're known? It's pretty important. So it's important that all voices are represented. How do we create change? We create change uh, through education, mentorship, and providing opportunities. Um, what do you think is the most important? There's no wrong or right answer. Um, what do you think is the most important? Education, mentorship, or providing opportunities? Of course, they're all important. But do you have one that's most important, top priority? What's that? Mentorship. mentorship? Why is that? I'm a social worker. Are you? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm, you're right, exactly. And it's really important to have a person that you can go to for advice. What should I do about this business decision or this interaction or what would you do if yada, yada, yada. I've called on my mentors many, many times and I'm so grateful for them. Any other thoughts about what, yes? Uh, I kind of feel like there isn't like a more important than the other. Mm -hmm. but I do feel like there is like a chain. You need opportunities to become a mentor and to get education to become a mentor and to educate other people. Mm -hmm. so I think they all go together, I guess. That's a really good point. They definitely all go together. Education is whoever I'm teaching, I feel like I'm their mentor. They may not call that, call me that, but I feel like I'm their mentor. Anyone I learn from, I see as a mentor. Um, providing opportunities um, for mentorship um, or an opportunity to be educated. So important. Um, here are some ways to support women year-round, but first, early last year, um, the Recording Academy teamed up um, with Berkeley College of Music um, and Arizona State University 
and created the Women in the Mix study. This is something that I worked on during my DEI ambassadorship um, last year. And we um, created a, a survey and broadcast it as far and wide as we could um, to all the women musicians and music creators and engineers that we could possibly find to get some data, actionable data, about how women, just kind of get the pulse about how women are feeling in the industry. Uh, so there are a couple of interesting points. Um, women uh, feel overworked and underpaid, and I want to also include um, gender non-conforming people um, in this, so please know that I am um, including them when I say women. Uh, women and gender expansive people in the industry are working multiple jobs and long hours. 57% have two or more jobs. 24 are working between 40 and 51 hours per week. And an additional 28% are working over 50 hours a week. 36% are making less than 40,000 per year. And almost half of them feel as they should be further along in their careers. Discrimination. They also face significant obstacles in their career. 84% of respondents distributed equally across all racial identities reported facing discrimination. 77% felt that they had been treated differently in the music industry because of their gender. And over one in two believed their gender had affected their employment in the industry and music creators and performers expressing this the most at 65%. Satisfaction. Despite these challenges, 78% of respondents reported feeling satisfied with their jobs, including over 80% in career categories that seem to face the most obstacles, such as freelancers and music creators and performers, um, those who worked in event and tour production, etc., were the least likely to experience satisfaction at 65%. So I see a lot of resilience here in, this, uh, in these responses about satisfaction. Despite all of these challenges, we still love our work. Um, challenges and recommendations. Uh, women and gender expansive people continue to face various kinds of discrimination based on their gender, 77%, and age, 60%. Pretty alarming, actually. And you know, it could be more. Um, this was a, an anonymous survey that didn't collect any personal data. So I'm hoping that um, uh, respondents felt comfortable being honest. Um, to address these challenges, um, they recommend equal opportunity programs at 20%. Mentorship at 17%. Advocacy around climate issues. Uh, nepotism and diversity, equity and inclusion at 19%. And having more women, gender expansive people and people of color in leadership positions. And that was at 8%. Uh, I'm gonna stop here on that and return. What are some ways that we can support women and gender expansive people year round, not just uh, one time per year or uh, once the study is out? Um, we can make the recording environment a safe space. What does that mean? Um, safe from harassment of any and all kinds. Um, and I would include um, sexism in that. It's a very pervasive, unfortunately, um, it's very pervasive still, at places you would least expect. Um, get involved with organizations that support women in audio. Are you guys familiar with Women's Audio Mission in San Francisco? It's a fantastic organization that educates um, women and gen gender expansive people to prepare them for um, different disciplines in music technology. And that's how I know Adria. Yay. Um, Hire women and provide support once they're on board. 
So it's one thing to hire, which we should be doing a lot more of, hiring women. Um, but once they're hired, uh, we also need to provide support in terms of you know, listening and creating um, an environment from the top down that is free from uh, harassment and sexism. Um, listen to women-created and women-focused music um, podcasts. Learn about uh, what women are doing and what's needed to uh, balance, balance things out and support them, actually. Um, provide basic amenities in venue dressing rooms. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is one of our uh, points on the inclusion writer. So that means a dressing room that is private, at least you know, somewhat comfortable, um, so that um, they have privacy, basically, and they're comfortable. Um, bring up women bookers promoters and festival organizers. So if we don't have people who are making decisions that um, are bringing in uh, more women and have a more balanced um, perspective, um, it'll be, it makes it much harder um, to change this. Um, in addition, support women-owned record labels. There are several out there now. Um, I don't have a list with me. Um, but uh, there are so many that you can support. Um, interact on social media the right way, and that means um, you know, representing women um, in a respectful way and not um, just for you know, visual reasons or what have you. I think you guys know what I'm getting at. Um, do more than stream. Um, I actually took this from uh, the Recording Academy, um, the results of this Women in the Mix study. And what they were saying is that it's great to stream. Uh, I think the top two uh, streamed artists are women, actually. Um, but there's more you can do. Um, you can create playlists um, with uh, musicians and works that are uh, created by women or gender um, expansive people. So these are just a few ideas um, for you guys in leadership positions um, or those of you who want to bring some ideas to people who are in leadership positions. This is a way that we can create um, equality in the music industry and music technology field, especially. Um, education, again, Women's Audio Mission. I teach Level 1, Intro to Recording and Music Production, each semester. It's an eight-week program. We're doing it online now. We may be going back into the classroom, but we're still doing it online. They have a great um, program for young girls. Uh, it's called Girls on the Mic, and they teach girls how to connect a microphone and record. Super cool. And there's Wham! everywhere. Um, on the Women's Audio Mission website, there is a uh, plethora of learning opportunities that are self-paced. So, and consider supporting them, if you can, financially. It goes a long way. Um, at SF Jazz, uh, we have um, every year, well actually for the last eight years, we've had an annual Girls Jazz Day on stage and in the mix. Uh, live sound education was um, the focus last year. In March, um, we're doing a recording program uh, for girls who play jazz at the center, and anyone who wants to learn, really. And um, we are fully supporting um, equality and diversity um, at SF Jazz in the digital lab where I teach as well. Um, another uh, as I mentioned, I teach um, at the Institute for the Musical Arts, collaborative home recording right now, and every summer I teach on site in Western Massachusetts. Um, Leslie Ann Jones is retired. Um, I'm on the faculty, Roma Barron, who worked with um, Laurie Anderson and Leanne Unger, who actually recorded um, K 
Kat Stevens and Leonard Cohen. She's a full-time professor. <laughs> um, actually, she just retired um, from Berkeley as a full-time professor of music technology and recording. So that's another great um, avenue for educating girls and women. Um, I think this concludes my presentation. Uh, that is where you can get a hold of me, Heidi Trefin at gmail.com or Facebook or Instagram, Twitter. It's all Heidi Trefethen. I'm the only Heidi Trefethen out there, I think. I did get a piece of mail the other day addressed to Trefethen instead of Trefethen. But you know, it's not an easy name, so it's okay. Um, let me see here, one moment. I have a couple minutes. I wanted to talk really quickly um, about a project that I'm working on. Uh, are you guys familiar with the band Four Non Blondes? Okay. Well, they uh, were, there's some, I can't speak, excuse me, I'm stumbling over my words. Um, they were from San Francisco. Um, they did the song What's Up with Linda Perry. So one of my SF jazz classes, um, I had a student um, that wanted to um, learn from me um, privately. And her name is Dawn Richardson, and she used to be the drummer for Four Non Blondes. So I, took a, I taught her a couple lessons, and then I decided, I don't know why, I wanted to play the drums, because I have always wanted to play the drums. So I tried to learn the drums. I tried to play the drums. I'm gonna stick with horn and other instruments that aren't percussion. Um, and one of the things that, um, one of the lessons I gave her was how to uh, record herself on her drums in her studio. Once we got that down, um, the pandemic hit. And it was a great time for uh, learning, of course. Did you guys finish YouTube also? Because I did. <laughs> and I finished the whole internet. <laughs> um, but we actually, I completed a couple projects, one of which um, was a project that we are now finished mixing and mastering on Thursday night. And our duo is called Molto, which means a lot or very much in Italian, because you know I speak Italian. And uh, it started out with one track. She sent me a track that she played or wrote um, along with drums that she recorded over it. And I was playing around and I accidentally put an instrument, um, like a, a pad and an arpeggio combo instrument in Ableton. She was doing all of her work in Logic. And um, so it was, it was a really cool mistake. I thought, wow, this should happen more often. So um, I sent it back to her. She loved it. So we had one song. And all of a sudden, we had four songs. And then all of a sudden, we had eight songs. And so I said, you know, we really need to mix this in a legit studio. And um, maybe, you know, do some licensing deals or something. So we have eight songs. Um, this is one of them. This is Pro Tools. Can you guys see it? Barely. So it's black and white because the engineer at Atomic Garden, where we did most of our work um, in the East Bay, um, likes goth mode. This is goth mode in... <laughs> in Logic, or excuse me, Pro Tools. So we, this um, project uh, was done in Logic, Ableton, and ultimately Pro Tools, because the studio didn't have um, Logic or Ableton, but it had an SSL 4000 G series, so we had to go there and do it there. All right, so we have live drums recorded um, and uh, various uh, synth parts. This is um, my song called Molasses. And I wrote it uh, during a tough time, you know, the George Floyd um, uh, period 
the riots um, as if the pandemic weren't enough. Um, and I felt that some days I was moving really slowly through molasses. And um, again, I have um, a couple of synth lines, sub bass, I have a satellite arpeggio, um, a couple other things, and uh, live drums we recorded at Atomic Garden. So I'm gonna play just a little bit for you. But I wanna let you know that how we uh, shared this, um, we did our work in our individual DAWs and then we exported at the highest quality we could um, audio files. We put them in our own projects respectively in our DAWs and then we brought them um, to the studio to mix and record live drums on. So this is one of eight songs. I'll play you a little bit. That's basically the gist of that. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to play just a snippet of another one, and it was basically the same process all throughout the. Yes. May I ask how many mics you use for the live drums? Oh sure. Um, well, we had a room mic. We had two room mics, stereo Ruben, and then another stereo pair. Um, that was kind of like an old crunchy sounding mic, just so we could have the choice of the two. Um, and then each, um, each, yeah, each drum was mic'd. We had two overheads, a Coles 4048, also ribbons. And then um, I think the kick, we had a U67 on the outside and then the inside, I believe it was an AKG D12, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the room was, totally cement. There were no carpets, no nothing. Um, we didn't opt for the crunchy sounding mic. It was just, it was, it was not the vibe. So, um, 
I'll play, I'll play another, another minute of another <laughs> song. Um, I know I'm, I'm aware that we have uh, just a little time left. I think. What should I play? Let's play this one. We stop here, but uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. We have stuff with uh, cello quartet, um, acoustic guitar, so we're called Molto. Um, let me see if I can. I have the. Oh, yes. We just got our logo. So uh, we like the mid century modern vibe. So look out for it. It'll be released in early 2023. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, what questions can I answer with the remaining <laughs> minutes? Yes. Do you prefer mixing up the tones or monitors? Uh, both, actually. Uh, I can't say I have a preference. Um, but lately, I've been mixing a lot on headphones. And I've been really surprised by the results I'm getting. And I actually mix on Sony um, MD7506 headphones. And the reason I think I can do that is because Andrew Sheps can do that. So, <laughs> yes. How did, you, uh, how did you arrange the recording for that horn trio? Piano, piano, violin, horn. How did I what? Sorry? How did you set up the microphones? And oh, what yeah. What did you use? So I had, um, let's see, I had a mic behind the horn, a mic in front of the horn, um, a condenser, an M49. Um, I had two KM84s, the predecessor to the 184s, on the piano. It's a Steinway uh, D model, nine foot, I believe. And I had a um, stereo ribbon on uh, the violin. It was great. It was, was that the great. SM24 as well? Yes, it was. It's a great mic. It's an investment, but well worth it. Yeah. Did I mention two room mics? So my Joseph and Omni. Uh, room mics I brought to the studio. So, so how did you do the mics on the piano? How did I do the mic? Yeah, how, how many mics on the piano? Just two. Just two mics, yeah. So I had it relatively, uh, like if this were the soundboard of the piano and the keys were right here, um, I, I think I had them uh, sort of like off axis. Um, one right here for the high strings and one right here for the low strings. And based on the location of the piano and how the piano sounded, where, you know, where it was in relation to the other instruments, that's what sounded the best. And that's how you should choose your mic technique. And mics. Yes? Uh, real quick, I know that we're all on time, but um, yeah. uh, I'm kind of new to like the orchestral, like even horn sections uh -huh. in general. So yeah. like, do you, when you say like, oh, I was second horn, uh -huh. are you going from left to right or right to left? Yes, left to right. So uh, principal, uh, second, third, fourth, and if there's six, all the way down. Um, assistant or co-principal will sit to the left side of the principal horn player. Yeah. 
So I play all positions, and not one is more important than the other. So, yes. Um, would you say uh, musical ability is like, uh, like, is really helpful in um, the engineering, audio oh. engineering? Tremendously, tremendously. I'm so grateful for my musical education. It, uh, to be able to read a score um, will set you apart from the rest, for sure. If you um, can detect intonation issues and fix it, um, your recording will be that much better. I feel like being an engineer gives me uh, a language uh, as a musician, and I feel the same um, being an engineer. And you know what I mean. It just informs both so much more. Yes. As far as like audio engineering, uh -huh. uh, while we're still like learning and yeah. taking classes, uh -huh. what would you recommend like to get our foot in the door for the industry? Like, what mm -hmm. can we do now? Like, mm -hmm. set us up? Yeah, that's a really good question. So many things. Um, continue learning outside of your classes. Watch, mix with the masters, or really good YouTube videos uh, or other videos. Uh, read Mix Magazine, Pro Sound News, um, learn about gear, learn about what each uh, preamp sounds like or microphone. What's the difference between a ribbon and a condenser, et cetera. Um, but in addition um, to um, honing your technical skills, it's vastly important to be able to connect with people really well. Um, so work on that. Um, you need to be able to uh, not be shy in those important situations, if possible, <laughs> and um, to develop self-confidence so you can talk to anyone. And when you connect with people, be very sincere. You know, care about what they're doing. Care about them. Um, ask them um, to help you learn something show up to um, different events for organizations um, that your school is having, or if there's like a job fair or something, um, find a mentor, someone that can, um, who you can trust, who uh, can help you uh, through situations that you might need advice with, um, business-wise or you know, personal, personality-wise. Um, uh, yeah, someone you can call on. Um, but those soft skills, those people skills, are incredibly important. I can't emphasize them enough. If you're a great person to be around, people like you, um, it is not more important than having the technical chops at all, um, but it will get you that much farther. In this industry, you're working long, long hours with many different types of people from cultures that you may not know or understand, different languages, um, personalities that might you know, push your buttons and uh, challenge you in those ways. And if you can work through those and get along with almost anyone and work with anyone, um, you're gonna be doing really well, I promise. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Actually, uh, what other questions can I answer? Yes. Curious specifically with SF Jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find artists come in with their own engineers at time, or, or mm -hmm. are you working on most of the shows predominantly? I work on most of the shows predominantly, but often engineers will bring their engineers. Um, and in that case, it's kind of like babysitting an engineer. And your job in that um, sense, or in that way, is to um, set everything up um, so that they can work very quickly and efficiently. Um, you know, with consoles, you know, once you learn to fly one plane, you can kind of fly them all, you know, with, you know, give or take a little bit. Um, but a certain touring engineer might have worked a lot on Digico or Soundcraft and may not know um, Avid's consoles very well or um, Midas. So 
um, you're, you're just, they're a guest in your house, literally. And you're making them feel comfortable, getting them what they need, um, making sure that the show runs without any hiccups. And I've had engineers um, come to me and say, you know, I don't really know this console that well. I need to lean on you a little bit tonight, or a lot. And it's, yeah, I'm going to help you all the way. I got your back. And it's so helpful when I'm in that position, um, when I don't know a room. I mean, every room is different. This room sounds different than, you know, somewhere at SF Jazz. Um, each has its character. We can think of it like um, an instrument. What makes one acoustic guitar different from another, if that makes any sense. So thinking about that. Did that answer your question? OK, great. Did that answer your question, by the way? OK, great. Yes. Uh, um, just, uh, I love Creighton Salvage, and I was wondering, how would you describe the characteristics of that room? How would I describe the characteristics of That's a really good question. Um, it is a very live room, actually. Um, it is all wood. There are no parallel surfaces, except I lied. The um, back of the stage and the back of the room, uh, so part of it is parallel. The, um, the diffusion is great. The soundproofing is excellent. Um, it's very noticeable when those almost 500 seats are filled. Um, the subs are under the stage. Um, the stage is hollow, actually, which um, creates, um, it can create a challenge with bass. Bass is a bit of a thing in there. Um, every, because it's so live and it's relatively small, um, the whole volume of the mix is determined by the level of the drums. So if you have a really loud drummer, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge to, um, you know, um, get a, a dynamic mix, so to speak, or something that's really quiet. Not necessarily quiet, but um, like nuanced, I would say. Um, but I do it all the time, so um, I know what the challenges are, and I can work with those. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. We just won, I think this year, uh, the best small venue in the Bay Area. If you haven't been, come on by. It's a beautiful place. What other questions can I answer? What's yes. Uh, 2020 Addison. So it's right at the downtown Berkeley stop. It's at Addison and Shattuck in Berkeley. Yeah. Yes. Um, so as far as the audio editing goes, would you mm -hmm. say um, Logic is a good um, DAW to start with, to start editing with and mixing? You mean editing? Yeah. Like the editing tools? You know, the editing tools are, uh, they're good. I think they're good. Um, I think, um, Logic strengths lie elsewhere in composition and score generating and um, instruments, composition. Um, if that's what you have and you want to start editing, go for it. Um, I think one of the reasons Pro Tools is the industry standard um, is because of the um, vast editing tools. Um, so I would actually advise learning those in Pro Tools first. But if that is what you have and you want to get started, just start tonight. Yeah, that's great. I think you should. <laughs> I think you should be able to work in any DAW. Don't let anyone tell you you can't create a great project in GarageBand. At the end of the day, it's all ones and zeros. It's what gets you um, to your completed project most efficiently? And can you work in a way in that program that um, doesn't give you too many technical obstacles so you can create and you can finish your work? But you need to, look, you need to know Pro Tools on an intermediate level, for sure, at least. OK, well, I really appreciate your time and for your uh, participation, your questions. And um, thank you so much for having me. I hope you'll go forth and make wonderful music. <laughs>